Hello, and welcome back to Learning with Lee. In today's episode, we are going to finish taking a look at C++ I.O. In particular, we are going to look at File I.O., String I.O., as well as also then how to end up properly using your objects with input and output. We're not going to go fully into how you would do a more complicated serialization of, in case I wanted to serialize pretty much any type of object into XML and back, in part because once you get into more advanced languages such as Java or C Sharp, they end up taking care of a lot of that for you, especially C Sharp. C Sharp has some really powerful tools that make it very easy to serialize objects to many different types without having to care about the full details of what's within those objects. It ends up adding on additional overhead, but at the same time, that's one of the costs of having something that powerful and that useful. So it's not going to be a full implementation of that. But to begin with, let's take a look at this little basic test here. And this is a very straightforward and simple one. And what you can see is that we have this string stream. And as you might guess, that is a stream similar to what we were dealing with earlier with O streams and I streams. And this one here acts for both input and output. If I want to, I could put an I or an O at the very beginning of it to specify explicitly do I want to use it only for input or only for output? And that's going to be a common thing you can do for pretty much any type of stream, is that you're going to have one that's explicitly input, one that's explicitly output, and one that can do both of those. So for now, we're just using one that can do both input and output. And for this one here, one of the important things to know about string streams that somewhat separates them from many other types of streams is that you don't actually have to initialize them with a string. For something like a file stream, I'm going to have to give it some file name as well as how I want to use that file. However, for a string stream, I don't have to give it some string. I don't have to go up here, go, I want some string s, I'm going to pass in that string into here. And while you can actually do that, the value for that though is, is in case I did something like string s equals whole bunch of random text in here. And then I want to start out with that data already being in my stream, or in case you want to read in something out of a string. And in particular, we'll get into possibly some of that when we get into parsing, though I think that most of what I've done with the parsing has managed to avoid requiring us in order to break things down line by line. But very often one of the techniques you'll see is, is that you'll end up using some, and we haven't gone over this really before, but there happens to be this standard and then get line. And you see that there's several different overloads, but basically what it takes in is it takes in a stream. And then what I would have to do is I'd have to go, okay, let's have some string s. And I want to pass in that as the second argument. And what it would do is it would then take up until the first new line character from stream and put it into this string. So very often you'll see people in which they go, give me a line. I'm going to analyze what that line does probably end up tokenizing it, going over its different values, and then you'll very often use string streams in order to basically output from that line into your object, into whatever values you have. But string streams, in the end, just basically create a buffer similar to what you already would have for a file or really any other input and output. In case you remember when we were going over file descriptors, it does the same thing with that. It just then ties it to a string by the end of it or possibly at the beginning of it when you pass one in. But the other important thing to note is that when I pass in this string s, this stream, s does not end up being populated by this stream. And this is different from some other languages such as Java, because Java will end up allowing you to use streams in order to append directly on to an existing string and then continue to add characters onto it without having to use any additional stuff. Whereas in this case here, this will initialize the stream with s. However, if I want to update s then, I would then have to go down here and use s equals stream dot str, which gives me the actual string, as in the standard library object string, represented by that particular stream. So that is one of the somewhat major limitations and easy gotchas that, that can happen here. So it's a common source of bugs that you'll think, oh yeah, it's going to update the string that I pass in, but you actually have to manually force it to update that string. So then what we're doing is we're creating a cube, fairly basic, it just creates one with this particular radius, and 
I'm not going to get too much into this, but it's relatively straightforward for this. If you want to spend some time looking through this and analyzing it on your own, figuring out why this ends up being what we do for the vertices and what this ends up being for what we do for the facets, I'll leave that for you on your own. But it's pretty simple in order to understand what that set of code is doing. So then what we're doing is once we have our cube, we're going to add it into this stream, and then we're going to output that stream to see out. And this just is a basic test to make certain that our output functionality works. And you'll very often see tests like this if you get into unit testing in the future, just to make certain that when you do try to output something, you do get the expected result. Typically then you're going to have some form of statement afterwards, known as an assert statement, that's going to then compare what you get out to what an expected string would be. So really you wouldn't do C out here, you'd do something like stir compare and end up making certain that the two strings are the same. Usually for most utilities that exist for unit testing, you'll just end up calling some assert function, it'll be overloaded to handle comparing strings by default. So you don't have to do that on your own. Outputs it, and you can see the result down here. And basically everything up until, if we scroll up here, up until this, so if I scroll down in here then, so everything above this is that representation of that polyhedron. So you can see that we end up with our facets down in here with the correct set of points. I'm not going to go over them fully one by, line by line, but I've gone over them before recording this just to double check that everything was working. So yes, it does indeed work for this. And if it didn't work, then our following test pretty much would not end up working. So that's just a basic one to make sure that we can actually output it or serialize it. And serialization is just a common keyword or term within the computer science industry, meaning that you're going to take some object, some data, and you're going to transform it into some really sort of language independent version. So it could either be you're going to serialize it into some binary file, you're going to serialize it into text. In this case here, we're serializing it into something that is very reminiscent of XML. And as you'll see in this XML file that we end up creating, it actually is somewhat parsable by Eclipse's default XML reader. And basically, XML is independent of your language. It's something that can be used by Java, it can be used by C, it could be used by C++, provided you have something to basically write it out into that version and then read it back in. And the writing out section is known as serialization, and the reading in is known as parsing. And we'll get into our two different methods for those in a little bit. So now let's move on to files. And for file streams, as you might guess, there's F streams, OF streams, and IF streams. You might think it would be file stream, but even though string stream happens to be long rather than just being S stream, which given how the rest of the naming is, you would expect it to be, these ones here are the more compact naming conventions for this. And I've just stored our file name up here so that we can reuse it throughout here without having to directly use this in multiple locations, which could lead to problems in case there was a typo. It allows us to also rapidly change it. So in case I wanted to then store it in polyhedron 2, I could also do that. But whenever you open up a file stream, you take in two different things. And by default, you don't actually need to supply the second argument. Because by default, what's going to do for in case it's an output stream, it's going to give you this iOS base out flag, particularly set for how you end up setting it. Or in case it's an IF stream, it's going to give you this iOS base in flag. In case it's an F stream, it'll give you both the output and the input. And the way in which you do that is you use this binary OR. And you've seen us use this pipe before when we've done double pipes, and that represents a logical OR. And what that's saying is, is that, is either of these true? When you're doing binary, in case you view it as a series of ones and zeros, so if I have some little set of like this here, and then this one here, what it's going to do is it's going to do character by character, so basic, well, bit by bit. So it's going to check, are either of those one? Yes. So then we get a one. Are either of the next ones one? Yes. So we get a one. Whoops. We do not get any twos. We get a one there. Neither of those ones are true, so we get a zero there. We get a one. We get a zero. We get a one. We get a one. And that's the way in which binary or like this works. And what, the way in which these flags work is that basically what you're going to have is you're going to have one of them that's one here, then you might have another one that's going to be like this. So that when you OR them, your result is going to be something along the lines of that, in which both of those flags are set. 
and it's a very common technique among lower level programming in order to set flags like that. It's not really a common thing that you'll see in case you ever start using Java or C Sharp or any other really modern programming language or any modern paradigms for programming, just because it's fairly ugly. But when you need efficiency and when you need that sort of functionality efficiently, it is an option for how you can actually implement it. So for this, we're saying we want the truncate flag set and the output flag set. And the reason for the truncate flag is just so as that we can end up taking our file here and then eliminating it down to zero and then outputting to it. And technically, there's also things such as app for append. There happens to be a few others, and they happen to be operating system dependent. They're mostly common across pretty much any operating system, but you might want to check to see if yours either is missing some or has extras. But typically, you're only going to need output, input, append, truncate. There is the option for binary here. So this is what you would end up doing in case you wanted to then output binary files or read in binary files. But for our purposes, we're just dealing with text right now. So we output to our file. We do this, we check that our file is open. That's one of the important things, is that you do want to make certain that you actually have a file that you can work with. And you can see when he, then here, it ends up using this file buffer. And I'm not going to get into how you can control stream buffering. There happens to be plenty of documentation online in case you want to actually look into how to manage buffers within streams. There are different varieties of buffers that provide you different buffering options in terms of how their buffers work and when they output things. However, that's in general something that you need to look into only when you end up experiencing lag or latency when you're dealing with input and output, or in case input and output end up taking up a ton of your runtime, in case you end up having an I.O. bound process is what's known as. But in case that ends up happening, that's when you can look into it. But for now, don't worry about it. The fact of the matter is that the default buffering tends to be good enough. And you'll if you end up in a situation where you need to change the buffering, it's easy enough to look it up on your own. So we just open up our file. We write out our cube to the file, same thing as we did up in this basic test where we just were outputting it to the stream here. And then we end up closing the file out because once again, this is a system resource. And if we don't close it out, that's going to lead us to some serious prompts because eventually we're going to run out of those system resources because they're just going to sit open even once we happen to be done using them. And that's a big problem, even bigger than memory leaks. So always be certain to close down your files. So then what we're going to do is we're going to open up that same file using an IF stream, and we're going to read it in. So we just are reading into this parsed polyhedron. Then it's the exact same thing. We just read it in. We close it down once we're done with it. And then down here, just to show that it succeeded, we output the parsed result. Oh, and we also delete our cube because as you might note here, we're getting back a pointer from create cube. And that ends up, of course, using, as you can see in here, the new keyword, which means that we end up having to use delete. And in case we scroll on down here, you can see in here, after the little dashed line, we end up getting out the correct values for our facets and vertices, all within this polyhedron here. As well as you can see over in here, that we end up having out our vectors and we end up having out our facets. And I'll leave it up to you in order to really go over that and check it all out for yourself to make sure that that all works. So I'm going to continue to keep this episode going, even though it is quite long at this point. And I'm going to go into how I ended up doing our output and input. Because we've already covered some of this in terms of overloading operators, in terms of using either the less than, well, double less than or the double greater than. And for this, I ended up creating this iGraphics object. And really, I could have called it iSerializable or anything like that. And basically, the general goal with this is that it acts as an easy-to-use interface for handling all of this input and output for us, as well as also allowing us to do this in a polymorphic manner. So as that we can end up using this effective same operator logic across many different types, and it ends up behaving in the same sort of manner. It ends up creating, basically, a coherent means of going, okay, we have this name here which is why we have this get start name, which just is basically getting the name of the particular object that we're using, followed by then, well, preceded by this less than and followed by a greater than, and then the end name, which is just as you can see on this line here. 
And the purposes of that is to create sort of this XML style in which we have our opening tag, we have our closing tag, and then within there we have whatever happens to be the value stored within that object. So for this, we we'll end up using this serialized method, and it's a virtual, technically pure virtual, and that just means that it ends up having equal zero, which results in this iGraphics object not being instantiatable, so as that you can end up only really using any of its children, any of the classes that are derived off of it, that have overridden this. And it forces any child class that's derived off of it to override this if you actually want this to end up being a class that you can instantiate. So if I want people to be able to use my polyhedron, I had darn well better provide a method serialized within polyhedron that overrides the one within here. Same thing for get name, same thing for parse. One of the key things I did here, and this is a very ugly mechanism for this, is that not every version of parse is going to remove this closing tag. In particular, in case, for example, facets, it doesn't know how many different numbers are in here. There could be four, there could be 50. So it's just going to go through until it fails. And as soon as it fails, it's going to hit this token. And this token is going to end up being still in that stream, which is why we then have to clear the stream so that we can then check, in case we failed, to remove the tag here. So we just create a string, we get that line, and then it advances us to this next line so as we continue processing as normal. So then within each of these, and let's just take a look at vector because it's relatively simple for vector. We have serialize and parse. And what we're doing with these is that in one case, we're just writing out our x, y, and z coordinates within that vector to our O string stream, and then getting the string represented by that so as that over in here, we can end up getting the string out of serialize and outputting into this stream here. Then for parse, we're sort of doing the opposite thing, except there's no reason to create any string streams. Technically, this I stream that we're taking in could be an I string stream, but it doesn't really matter. All that matters is that we need the ability to read in three tokens, and hopefully they are all doubles. If they aren't, it's going to fail. And the other thing is that down here, note this little return true, that's specifying that over in here, we want to remove the closing tag, because this, as you can see in here, is doing nothing with that closing tag right now. For facets, what we end up doing is we end up, for serialize, once again create a string stream, and then for each point in our point indices, we're going to output it to the stream followed by this little space here, and then we're going to flush the stream and add on a new line character to it. And that's how we get the string there. For reading it in, basically what we do is the reason why I end up doing it in this manner is that if we do it in the other and more obvious manner, which is to put our stream to index in here, and then I'm going to check that our stream is good. If I do that, what's going to end up happening is that our stream is going to go bad at a certain point when it can't read it in, when we hit that closing tag. And at that point, it still is going to push on the last index because it won't actually have updated this value here it'll still be whatever the previously read-in value is. Basically, then we'll wind up with a duplicate at the end of our list, which is much uglier than in case, say, we have this here, because what it'll do is it'll read it in. If it successfully reads it into index, good will be true, and then we can push it to the back and repeat this. For polyhedron, then, what we end up looking at is parse, and parses, as well as for serialize, these are going to be a wee bit ugly, but not actually that bad. Parse is definitely the uglier of the two, because for serialize, all that we're doing is we just need to output each and every one of our points, well, vectors, and each and every one of our facets. And we do need to dereference it so that it can then be recognized as this iGraphics object and be handled correctly. Then, once we're reading it in, we're going to sort of need to do the same thing in reverse, but the major thing is that we don't know what we actually happen to be looking at for the next object that we're reading in. And this is one of the values about things such as XML files is that there could be vectors intermixed with facets. They don't have to have this clean divide between the two of them, and it still will end up working out just fine for this. There are things I could do in case for whatever reason I had multiple things that ended up using vectors and there were multiple collections of them. 
for a particular collection, such as our points collection, we could add on basically the additional tag for the fact that it happens to be within the points section and basically add our opening and closing tags for it. But what we're looking at doing is, is that we're looking at going, okay, we want to have these vector and facet dummy variables that are setting up here, as well as we want to know their names early on so as we don't have to go through, because if you look at this, this ends up requiring creating a new string every time. It requires doing these append operations. It ends up being somewhat expensive. It's more efficient just to cache that in a stream. So that when we get down to these comparisons, to see what type of item we're going to read in and parse and create an object to the correct type of, as well as what operations we're going to do, we can do those comparisons quickly and efficiently. So we end up using get line in order to get whatever our next line is from our stream. And basically, we do once again check that we get the actual correct thing, make sure that we aren't at the end of the file, because in case we hit the end of the file or in case our stream gets corrupted, good will be set to false. And then we can basically exit out of here and it'll let us know that we need to be done with that section of it. And that will actually pops out to here. It'll end up clearing that, but it won't end up doing anything extra here, which could once again reset it into a bad state. And then we'll end up returning the stream from it as pretty much any of these operators ends up doing. So for this, we end up doing our comparisons in case we get a vector. We're going to read it into our existing vector up here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a new vector that takes in that vector and basically copies the values from it and add that new vector to the back of our points collection, since it is an array of pointers to vectors. In case it were just an array of vectors or vector references, I would have to do something such as basically vector 3D and then put some stuff there, or I could even just do vector 3D like that. However, because of the fact that it deals with pointers, we end up using new. But that's not a really big issue since we do take care of that in our destructor. Similar thing for facets. We end up reading it into the facet. We create a new facet that then copies our little temporary facet variable up here, and then pushes that to the back. And finally, in case we end up hitting our end name, and really this is something that I probably should actually store sort of similar to how I have these names up here, just as I have it cached and it's a bit more efficient that way, then we end up exiting. And one of the things I'm not doing right now is, is that in case we hit something that's unknown, I'm not exiting. We just advance to the next line. And really, I think that's probably enough for what we've covered in terms of parsing, serializing, file I.O., string I.O., and just I.O. in general for C and C++. So I would recommend doing is I would recommend downloading this. I'll have this in the description. Download it, look through it, see if you can figure out any spots that are giving you problems in, in case there's something you're just not getting or in case something's a bit too obfuscated to be clear or in case there's something I forgot to go over. Feel free to let me know about that in the comments and I'll be certain to respond and try to explain what I was thinking when I wrote that and why I wrote what I did. Thank you very much for watching. Have a wonderful day.